Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to part two of cell recognition and the immune system. To watch part one, just follow the link top right. But for now, let's pick up where we left off. Just to recap, we've just finished off with the humoral response, antibodies, vaccines and active and passive immunity. Next, we'll have a look at the human immunodeficiency virus, more commonly known as HIV and why antibiotics are ineffective against viruses. So for HIV, you need to know the structure well and make sure you know this diagram as often you'll be credited if you can draw it in exams. So we have genetic material, which for HIV is RNA. We have a reverse transcriptase enzyme, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There's a lipid envelope and also a matrix. There is a capsid as well as attachment proteins, which allow the virus to bind to complementary receptor proteins on the surface of T helper cells. So we've already had a look at how viruses replicate inside host cells previously in the specification, but now we need to consider how HIV specifically replicates inside a T helper cell. Just a quick note that a reverse transcriptase enzyme is an enzyme which catalyzes the production of DNA from RNA, and it's an enzyme which is required for viral replication. So first of all, HIV binds to the host T helper cell antigen receptor via its attachment protein. Next, the viral capsid and the host cell surface membrane fuse and RNA and reverse transcriptase enter the T helper cell. The reverse transcriptase is used to make a complementary strand of DNA using the viral RNA template. From this, double-stranded DNA is made. This DNA is inserted into the host cell's DNA. Next, the viral DNA is transcribed into mRNA, containing instructions to make new viral proteins using the host cell's enzymes. The mRNA is then translated into the viral proteins and assembled into virions, which are offspring viruses, which are then released from the cell and go on to infect other cells. Overall, this means that many T helper cells are killed, meaning that we have an insufficient number of T helper cells. This means that B cells are not stimulated to produce antibodies. Cytotoxic T cells are not stimulated to kill infected cells, including cancer cells and memory cells are also infected and destroyed. Overall, this means that the immune response is greatly compromised, making the body more susceptible to opportunistic infections and certain cancers. As AIDS develops, infections become more serious as the immune system becomes weaker and weaker. Note, however, that HIV doesn't kill individuals directly. It is the fact that a person becomes infected by a certain disease and their immune system cannot respond to this infection effectively, which leads to death. Common symptoms include diarrhea, tuberculosis and pneumonia. Next, we have to consider why antibiotics are ineffective against viruses. So antibiotics interfere with metabolic reactions of bacteria. They disrupt metabolic mechanisms, which includes enzymes and ribosomes. Viruses, however, use those of the host cell. So for humans, viruses would target human enzymes and ribosomes. This means that antibiotics cannot be used against viruses. Viruses also do not have the sites where antibiotics can work. And in effect, to treat against viruses with antibiotics, you would have to target human enzymes and ribosomes, which would damage your own cells as well. Nice, so now that we've covered HIV and why antibiotics are ineffective against viruses, we finally need to have a look at monoclonal antibodies and the ELISA test. So let's start with monoclonal antibodies, which are antibodies produced from a single group of genetically identical B cells. Therefore, they're all identical in structure. They are highly specific because their antigen binding sites have a unique tertiary structure that is complementary to only one antigen. They can be made to bind to any antigen, and this can range from a cell to a virus. There are several uses of monoclonal antibodies, one of them being to target medication to specific cell types, such as cancer cells. In this example, monoclonal antibodies are produced that are specific to receptors on cancer cells. 
the antibodies attached to the surface of the cancer cells and hereby block chemical signals that stimulate their uncontrolled growth. And this is called direct monoclonal antibody therapy. In indirect monoclonal antibody therapy, radioactive or cytotoxic drugs can be attached to the monoclonal antibodies. When they attach to the cancer cells, the cells are destroyed by the drug. Monoclonal antibodies can also be used for medical diagnosis, for example, in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Men with prostate cancer produce more of a protein called prostate-specific antigen, PSA. High levels of PSA in the blood is often an indicator of prostate cancer. It is possible to measure the levels of PSA in a blood sample by using monoclonal antibodies that interact with PSA specifically. So why are monoclonal antibodies so useful? Well, the antibodies themselves are not toxic. They are highly specific, so they only target a specific cell type, for example, cancer cells, and therefore they have fewer side effects. Also, smaller doses are needed to be effective because they are so highly specific. However, the spec also wants us to consider ethical issues surrounding the use of monoclonal antibodies as well as vaccines. So vaccines are tested on animals before entering human trials and therefore the animals may suffer in the process. Also deciding on who gets vaccinated first in the case of a new epidemic. Animals such as mice are used to produce the cells from which monoclonal antibodies are produced. And here cancer is deliberately induced in the animal so that it produces tumor cells, meaning that it suffers in the process. And finally, we have the ELISA test, ELISA standing for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay. It's a very useful test as it allows us to determine the presence and quantity of a protein in a sample. It can be used to detect for infections, allergies and drug levels in the body, for example, when testing for doping in athletes. In the ELISA test, an antigen is bound to the surface of the well. The antibody specific to the antigen we're testing for is added, which will bind to the antigens if they're present. The special thing about these antibodies is that they're enzyme linked, i.e. they have an enzyme attached. Next, we rinse out the well to remove any unbound antibodies, which may lead to any false positives. Then a substrate solution is added containing the substrate to the enzyme on the antibody. The reaction catalyzed by the enzyme causes a color change. We can use a colorimeter to measure the color intensity and the intensity measured will be relative to the amount of antigen present. Nice, and that would be us done for the immune system. Thanks guys for watching Spec Transfer. Next time we'll be looking at surface area to volume ratio.